Okay. Public traveler. Now I know why they call him the river walking redheaded hussy. <laughs> I have to keep you in line. Yeah. Are you ready to go? Ready. Be quiet then. <laughs> All right. Good morning. We are coming to you this morning from Doors of the Word Baptist Church at 14781. That's 1478 Berry Road in New Berry, Ohio, with a zip code of 44065. I'm Pastor Ernie Sanders, and the title of the message this morning is Rebellion is as the Sin of Witchcraft. And uh, we're going to be starting this morning in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and taking a look at the Amalekites. Now, they were a very, very cruel and barbaric people. And they were the first to attack Israel as Israel had fled from Egypt. Now, some historians believe that the Amalekites were on their way to attack Egypt uh, when uh, they encountered Israel. And uh, they conquered and ruled Egypt for 200 years. And we start again in verse 1. Samuel also said unto Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which the Amalekite did to Israel, or which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way, and he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both men, man and woman, and infant, and suckling ox, and sheep, camel, and ass. Well, you know, that's a, one of the most controversial passages of Scripture there. And the liberals will always use these first three verses to try to justify condemning God. Whenever you condemn what communism or what the radical Islam does, they try to use these. We'll, we'll take a look at that as we go through this message. And uh, here we find out that the Amalekites would continually attack Israel. If you, if you turn over to Exodus, went all the way back to Exodus chapter 17. In Exodus chapter 17, I want to read verses 8 through 16. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel, the Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out, men, and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and her went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass that when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat therein, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hand, the one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah Nissi. He said, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So, here we see, uh, in fact, if you, if you turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 25, and in Deuteronomy chapter 25, I want to read verses uh, 17 through 19. Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when you were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou wast faint and weary and feared not God. Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, 
and thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under earth heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. Well, you see, old, they were, like I said, like the Chaldeans. They were a very cruel and heartless. Well, they were like the communists in ISIS are today. And uh, what they did is they, they came in behind and they, they picked on those that had the hardest times, those that could barely keep up. Uh, where they slowed down. The elderly people, the, those that were sick, those that were lame, and they slayed, and they killed them. And here now, if we go back to chapter 15, we pick it up in verse 5. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and said, Wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Canaanites, Go depart, get down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Canaanites departed from among the Amalites. And Saul smote the, Amal the Amalites from Habia until he comes to shore that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Am Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and of the lambs, and all that was good. It would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refused, they destroyed utterly. So, here now, Saul had his instructions to destroy everything, not to leave anything alive. But somehow along the line, they thought that they could, you know, the people said, yo, gee, Saul. And look at all of these sheep and all of these cattle and all of these things. There's, well, there's a whole lot of good things there. Uh, why destroy it? Let's, you know, shouldn't we get the bounty? And folks, if God tells you to do something, just do it. Don't argue. You're not going to win the argument with God. Okay? And so Saul kept the best. How did he justify that? Well, he said, we, we're going to use those and we're going to make an offering, a sacrifice to God. God makes it very clear from Genesis to Revelation, obedience is the number one thing he wants. But then on top of that, see, Saul tried to make himself look like a, like a man who was compassionate. And, and, uh, and so he kept Agag, their king, this wicked man, alive. And it could be that he kept him alive because he, he knew that he was such an adversary, maybe in some strange way, he had some kind of a respect for him because they always did battle. <coughs> By the way, God didn't send Saul out to destroy the, the entire nation of the Amalekites. He just sent him out to, dis, to destroy the cities, the, those uh, several cities that he sent him to. And so he said, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he turned back from following me, and had not performed my commandments, and it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Well, see, God knew all along what Saul was going to do. See, God is always, you know, way out ahead of us. You know, we, again, we, we have to hear the now. We, we see what we have right now. And, and this is all that we can actually claim. Because we, we can't retreat. Five minutes ago, we can't ever bring that back. We can't reclaim that. And we may not have five minutes from now. You never can tell what could happen. But God, not only is the past, but he sees the past, the present, and the future. He knew what, what Saul was going to do. And he always used everything to teach his people a lesson for those people that would be willing to learn. Those people that would be willing to listen and to learn. Remember what he says in Hosea 4, 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And when Samuel rose up early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place, and has gone about, and passed on, and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandments of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth then the bleeding of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? In other words, he was telling him, You did? Uh, why do I hear the sheep bleeding? How come the sheep and the oxen are still alive? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites for the people, spared the best of the sheep of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. 
and the rest we have utterly destroyed. You see, God, when God tells you to do something, He wants you to do what He tells you. Right? You see, this is why He gives us His Word to Bible, so we understand. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Lean not to your own understanding. People lean to their own understanding and away from the Word of God. That's when they get in trouble, right? Oh, yeah. You say, well, you know, I think this is what the Lord would have me do. You're better off to know what the Lord would have you do, and He tells you. He writes it, literally spells it out for you, right? Amen. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou was little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. When Saul first was sent to and when Samuel was sent to Saul, Saul didn't know why he, I mean, he didn't know if he could handle this. This is a big responsibility. You want me to be king? I don't know, you know, that's I don't know if I can do that. Okay. Now Saul was uh, very easily distinguished amongst the rest because he was about a foot taller than anybody around him. Uh, he was a big man. And the Lord sent, uh, sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners of the Amalek Amalekites and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yeah, I, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I, I have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of, the, of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalek. But the people took of the spoil of sheep and oxen and sheep of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord my God and kill God. Okay, you see what he was doing? It was kind of like Adam and Eve, remember? Adam, Adam placed the blame when the Lord said, Adam, why did you eat of the fruit? Well, it's that woman you gave me. That woman you gave me. I wouldn't have done it, but that woman, she, well, she's the one that convinced me, right? We know how that is, right, Phil? <laughs> but anyhow, what did Eve say? Uh, the devil made me do it. The devil made me. He be God. The devil made me do it, right? And so now old Saul is, is saying here, you see this, uh, you know, the people, they, you know, <coughs> they wanted to offer up a sacrifice to you, Lord. Okay. See, this isn't washing with the Lord. So, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Amen. For rebellion is as, is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as iniquity, and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Now, Here it's an interesting thing. Uh, he was told that that rebellion was the same as witchcraft. He knew that witchcraft was something uh, that God didn't care a whole lot for, right? In fact, if you turn over to 1 uh, Samuel chapter 28, Samuel chapter 28, starting with verse 1. And it came to pass that in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel. And Achish and said unto David, No, it is surely that thou shalt go out with me to battle, thou and thy men. And David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know what thy servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore, Will I make the keeper of mine head forever? Now Samuel was dead, and all of Israel had lamented him and buried him 
Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul put away those out at those that had familiar spirits and the wizards of the land. And the Philistines were gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all of Israel together and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams nor by Urim, nor by the prophets. So now, see, old Saul always had the Lord behind him when he was in obedience. But now in his disobedience, God says, you're on your own, boy. In fact, in his disobedience, actually, God became his enemy to a point. So now what does Saul do? See, so you got two options. One of the options is to go before the Lord and repent and repent and repent. Like the king of Nineveh and hope that God hears you. The other is to try to find another source of information. <laughs> and this is that was the wrong choice. Then said Solomon to the servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And the servant said to him, Now, if he'd have done that today, he might have gone after Hillary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the servant said unto him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, and he went and, and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those who have familiar spirits, and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore, Thou layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die. And Saul swear to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw God's ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man coming up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed from the Philistines. Make war against me. And God has departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by the prophets, nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Then Samuel, wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord has departed from thee, and has become thine enemy. And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me. For the Lord hath rent the kingdom of thy hand, out of thy hand, and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. Because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee. Unto the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with thee. And the Lord shall deliver the host of Israel unto the hand of the Philistines. Then Saul fell straightway all along on the earth, and was sore afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no bread all that day, nor, nor all the night. And the woman came unto Saul, and saw he was troubled and said unto him, Behold, thy handmaid hath obeyed thy voice. I have put my life in thy hand and have hearkened unto thy words which thou speakest unto me. Now therefore I pray thee, hearken thou also unto the voice of thine handmaid and let me set a morsel of bread before her thee and eat that thou mayest have strength and thou goest on thy way. But he refused and said, I will not eat 
but his servants together with the woman compelled him. And he hearkened to her voice. So he rose from the earth and sat upon the bed. And the woman had a fat calf in the house, and she hasted and killed it, and took flour and kneaded it, and did bake unleavened bread thereof. And she brought it before Saul and his servants, before his servants, and they did eat. Then they rose up and went away that night. Well, now you see here, the old witch of Endor was very, very surprised when Samuel came up. Do you know why that is, folks? First of all, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Now, mm -hmm. this was a very, very special case that God allowed Samuel to be returned. You see, most of those people brought up from beneath. <laughs> they not Those people were not from heaven. They were not God's people, not saved people. Mm -hmm. But in this case, this is where the old witch, uh, she expected to be one of the demonic spirits that she was going to raise up. And boy, when she saw it was Samuel himself, she knew then that it was the Lord that had done that. Mm -hmm. And uh, folks should say, fearful, fearful thing to fall into the hand of the living God. And she thinks she had something to fear with Saul. Mm -hmm. By the way, Saul had gone out and he had killed off all the soothsayers and all the spiritualists in the land. He'd, he'd killed them all off. And this was one of the few that was still around. And so, when God sent him out again to destroy the, the Amalekites, he didn't destroy the entire nation. That would come much later. In fact, if you turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 1, you see that Saul himself was later killed by an Amalekite. And we start in verse 5, 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 5. And David said unto the young man that told him, How knowest that Saul and Jonathan his son be dead? And the young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and his horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called unto me. And I answered him, Here I am. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish has come upon me, because my life is yet whole of me. Now, what he was saying was this, that he was wounded. Saul had become wounded very seriously, but he was far from being dead. And he knew that if he got captured by the enemy, uh, he'd, he'd be much better off to be dead than to be captured by the enemy. And so he told this Amalekite, this young man, I want you to stand over me and kill me now. Uh, there was nothing to make the Amalekites any happier than to kill the, the Israelis, right? And so, so I stood upon him and slew him because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head and the bracelet that was on his arm and brought them hither unto my Lord. Well, he figured, look, uh, they, they weren't getting the best part of this battle and he would be better off if he somehow found the favor of David because David was, uh, was whipping up, he, he was doing a big job uh, on the Amalekites. Then David took hold on his clothes and ripped them and likewise all the men that were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for his, Jonathan his son, and for the people of the Lord, and for the house of Israel, because they were fallen by the sword. And David said unto the young man, that old that told him, Whence art thou? And he answered, I am the son of a stranger, and the Malachite. And David said unto him, how wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand and destroy the Lord's anointed? Mm -hmm. Well, over in Numbers 12, 8, I believe it is, it says, Touch not God's anointed. Touch not God's anointed. And this might be a message that uh, some of you need to send. Today I'm going to give you the phone number. Roy Moore is a, a very godly man yeah. as, as a Supreme Court Justice in Alabama, 
and the communists try to remove him. And I'm going to give you a phone number. I need you all to call there and let him know and just say to him, touch not God's mind. You need to do that. I'm going to give you the governor's number and the head of this judiciary committee there. And David called one of the young men and said, go near and fall upon him. And he spoke him that he died. Well, anyhow, so David had that young man killed, the one that killed Saul, because he touched God's anointing. I want to go now over to, uh, back to where we were. 1 Samuel 15. Take it up, verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord to Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord. And the Lord rose up, and Samuel rose up early to meet Saul in the morning. Well, here now, uh, if you turn over to 1 Samuel I think I'm just going to stop right there because I've already read it through. And, uh, <coughs> pardon? Right. And so, here I want to take a look at it and do some comparison with current events. Now, again, the liberals often use verses 1 through 9 to judge God, 1 Samuel 15. And they say, how in the world could God, how in the world could God send them in and to kill all of those people, uh, especially how could God kill the little babies? How can you, how can you preach against us and call us murderers because we kill babies by abortion when God sent his armies in to make war? First of all, uh, listen, the liberals have no more credibility or authority to, to judge God than a flea has to judge us when we step up. Okay. And first and second of all, look. God is totally holy. God is totally just, and there is no one, no one, uh, that has as much compassion on people uh, as God. And He knows what the future is. And for all of those little children that He takes home early, believe me. Uh, when they leave this world, they go right to be with the bosom of the Lord. They go right to be to a much, much better place. And he spares those innocent children uh, from the life that they would probably have living under the cruel, cruel heathen Amalekites. Now, in 2012, at the Democratic or Communist Party convention, the mention of God, just the mention when... When God was mentioned, it brought on a whole chorus of boos. The whole place started booing. And then uh, the liberals, a rebellious, godless people like the Amalekites, and all of their simple-mindedness thought that they could escape God's righteous judgment by voting him out of, out of their party and out of their convention. What they failed to understand, all of their feeble-mindedness was that God was never in their party to begin with. From the uh, days when the Ku Klux Klan was the enforcement arm of the party, until now, they have been totally void of God. Like the Amalekites, they, the liberals, <coughs> would eventually be utterly destroyed. And God uh, did eventually destroy them, and he will eventually destroy all of those today that we call liberals, the ones that refuse to repent. In fact, if you turn to Matthew chapter 25, and in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 45, and when the Son a man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels <coughs> with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all the nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the, set the sheep on the right hand, <coughs> the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, my blessed and my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you 
from the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came into me. Then shall the righteous answer him and say, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered or fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brother, and you've done it unto me. Now, during the tribulation period, all of those that uh, befriend the Christians and Jews that are being sought for extermination, well, like they are today, Christians and Jews today are being sought for extermination by the Muslims and the communists. And I can tell you this, if you don't think it, I know a lot of you, it's hard for some of you to understand, but if those people, if the Obamas and the Hillarys could, if they could do it today, they would eliminate us, okay? Uh, one of Obama's mentors, Bill Ayers, said back in the 70s, and I remember when he said it, that they needed to eliminate at least 25 million people, those that were the strong, those strong conservative Christians that were in a place of authority. Well, take that forward to today, and it would probably be 75 million that they would have, that they would like to exterminate. And so, so what he's telling you here, those that uh, those that helped, those that came to the aid of those that were uh, marked for extermination, those were the ones that got saved, in the, and uh, they will sit at the right hand of the Lord when they've done it as much to the least of mine. You've done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me. Ye cursed unto everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was a hunger, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying unto him, Lord, when saw thee a hungry, a hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of mine, you did it not unto me. Now, there are those out there today in your, the apostate church. The apostate church, they preach a whole different Jesus than we preach. This is, these are the words of the Lord Jesus himself right here. Now, if you think that I'm a hellfire brimstone preacher, uh, listen, I would sound very meek and mild compared to what our Lord preached. And uh, I could never, you see, have the the authority to preach like the Lord Jesus did. I'm preaching what the, these are the words. He literally spelled it out. This isn't my sermon. It belongs to God. Amen. And I'm preaching his words there. And folks, I'm going to tell you, what did he say? Heaven and earth will pass, but his words will never, never pass. And that'll happen. Now, everywhere it's an interesting thing you find in Scripture where the left is involved, okay, uh, the left ends up going south, going to hell. I mean, if you go back, you go to start Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 2. It said, those on his right, those on the right hand, that a, will follow his right, that a godly man, a good man, a righteous man will follow the ways of the right, but the wicked will follow the ways who will turn towards their left. Then he tells you right here, those who come back again. How many times we mentioned to it how Obama, when, when they came out and they had the uh, Matthew 25 coalition, the religious left, and they thought that they were going to totally get away with this because the people are so biblically illiterate, they'll never, never pick up on it. But I, I, I picked up on it right away. And I started telling people, so you want to know who they are? And I started preaching. Other uh, preachers, radio preachers, started picking it up. And they pulled the ads right away when it started going on, who they really were. Those on the left will spend eternity. And today, if you happen to be, you believe in God, if you happen to be 
Uh, someone who is Proverbs 28 1 says, The righteous are as bold as lions. Then they call you a right wing. If you believe in God, if you have if you have principles, if you have values, if you have moral morality, if you believe in decency, they call you a right wing fanatic. But if you embrace everything that God's word, the Bible calls you sin, they call you a left wing. Like the Communist Party. That's right. And so all through scripture from Ecclesiastes chapter 10, the two thieves, the one on the right entered into the kingdom, the one on the left was the one that denied Christ. Here we see this, that those on the right will inherit the kingdom of God, and those on the left will wish they had. And so here, all of those liberals out there today that still think that they can judge God, well, as you just read, they're going to be judged by that very God that they thought that they could judge. Turn over to Revelation 20. I want to start in verse. Revelation 20 and uh, start in verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that the old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till a thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Well, those saints that we just talked about, the ones that, that uh, in Matthew chapter 25, they go through the millennial kingdom, and I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and the judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, that had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads and in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed is holy is he that is in part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God in Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four quarters of the earth, God and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, Encompass the camp of the saints about. In the beloved city, a fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived him was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast of the false prophet are. And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written, and the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and hell delivered up the dead which were then. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, now new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes.